Ignore this. Um, it's just to prevent my cat from getting behind the dishwasher and me having another panic attack when I can't find him. Today's video is going to be a little bit different because it's a true crime video. I want to talk about something that happened, but I also want to talk about these like urban legends and uh, basically a story time about a haunted house here in Arizona. If you guys have been on my channel for a while, you might remember I made a video all about this house a couple years ago, like back when I started doing my Ouija board stuff at the very beginning of that. I went to the house and I showed you everything, but I really only talked about the urban legends connected to the house, but I never told you guys that one of the urban legends is actually true. The reason I'm bringing all of this back up a few years later is because I was at Brittany's house on New Year's Eve. We wanted to watch a movie, do something simple for New Year's, and we came across a documentary called Cali Lejos on Amazon. It was like a nine minute short film, and honestly, it was fucking terrible. Like, I was laughing the whole time. It was, it was really bad. But these people decided to make a short film about what is said to have happened at this haunted house. The house is like maybe 10 minutes from me. It's really close. I used to go there all the time in high school. Me and a group of people would always go there. We went on Halloween just to freak ourselves out. It was a very popular spot for high schoolers when I was in high school. It was abandoned, it was creepy, and some of the stories behind it were actually really terrifying. I went inside the house a few times. It actually ended up burning down, which is the footage that I have in my video that I uploaded a few years ago. I couldn't actually go into the house because it was so destroyed, but when we used to go to the house, it was just covered in graffiti. All of the glass was broken, like people had broken all the windows. There was fishing wire strung all over the floor, so when you walked in, you'd either trip or you would touch it and just get freaked out. People fucked this house up. And if you were brave enough to go upstairs, you would see the word prom written in blood on the walls. And that's actually one of the urban legends behind the house. I don't remember the story completely because it was one of the less popular ones, but it was something about a guy murdering a girl on prom night. So something along those lines. I think the story that people believed the most was that the man who lived in this house was in the military. He got sent away, he had to go do something, and so the house was left completely abandoned. And then a bunch of teenagers came in and completely trashed the place, which honestly still sounds like exactly what happened. But the scariest one, and the story that we would tell people when we would take them for the first time, is that a man murdered his wife and his two children and buried them in the backyard. And while that story might not be true with this specific house, it is a true story that did happen in Arizona. The stories do differ quite a bit. There wasn't that much detail in the house behind Cali Lejos. It was just like people came up with all of these different stories. But it turns out that this one specific story did actually happen. And so that's what the documentary is actually based on. Even though it didn't happen at that house, the documentary is about the house on Cali Lejos and this murderer, this guy murdering his family. So I was talking to Brittany and she was like, it's so weird that they would make the documentary like this because that's not what happened there. I, it's, it's strange that they would attach this story to this house because this actually happened. But nonetheless, it made me want to film this video because I want to talk about the murders that did happen. Before I go into the actual story though, I want to talk a little bit more about the house. I want to show you guys footage of this house from when it was burnt down. I mean, this is somewhere that me and my friends would go to almost every single weekend, whenever we could, because we loved freaking ourselves out. I've always loved scary things and horror and ghost stories. And so this is one of our favorite spots to go. And then I also talked about another place called the Birdcage in that video as well. I'm not going to go into detail about that because it's completely unrelated, but I figured I would just throw it in. And then I went on Zillow today because I was just curious what the house looked like. I knew they were redoing it, like they were rebuilding it, but I had no fucking idea that this was going to be as beautiful a home as it is. I'm gonna show you pictures that might be weird, but it's amazing what they were able to do with this place. And it's so crazy to think that like, this was once a place where me and my friends would go to get scared because it was abandoned, it was creepy, and it was dirty and dusty and dark. And now it's like, just gonna be somebody's home. Like, I don't know, it's just so weird to think about how things change throughout time. Like, I, I, I know it's unrelated, but I, I just wanted to talk about it. And so now let's get into the actual story that happened, not at the Cali Lejos house, but unfortunately it was something that did occur in 2001. The story stays the same. A man did kill his wife and two children. I'm gonna read the news article because I feel like it would be more beneficial than me trying to just summarize everything on my own. But the title of the article, which I'll have linked down below, says a man murders family in 2001 and the bodies were found four years later. A Peoria man was convicted of the murder of his wife and two stepchildren whose bodies were not found until four years after the crime. It was July 7, 2001. Donna Anthony and her two children were scheduled to land in Ohio to visit relatives. They never arrived. They never got on the plane. Family members asked the police to investigate. I'm not sure if this is 100% true, but in the documentary, they were leaving to go to Ohio to get away from him because they were scared of him. The mom and her two kids planned on just leaving, getting away and escaping this 
man. The next day, Maricopa County Sheriff's Office deputies went to their Peoria home and talked with David Anthony, Donna's husband, who deputies say did not seem overly surprised and did not ask the deputy to search for them. Donna's truck was located by police three days later. The vehicle was cleaned inside and out, which according to Donna's co-workers was very unusual for her. Investigators said that the truck was wiped clean. They found only five fingerprints on the truck belonging to Donna. When the investigators returned to the Anthony home, they found it in immaculate condition as well, with a strong odor of pine salt. Inside were professionally cleaned carpets, brand new mattresses, clothes washer, clothes dryer, and vacuum cleaner. Though the home looked clean, when detectives applied a chemical that fluoresces when contacting blood, they found samples of blood in the home. In the trash, they located pine salt, rubber gloves, and two bloodstained knives. Prosecutors say David Anthony planned the murder after they refinanced their home and took out over $100,000 in cash. Donna, not trusting David with the money, deposited it in a personal account. On June 28th, three days after Donna bought her tickets to Ohio, someone altered the PIN number to the account. Later that same week, David bought a new truck but delayed the completion of the deal telling the salesman he would come into some money soon. On July 6th, a call was placed from Donna's phone transferring $84,000 from Donna's account to their joint account using the newly changed PIN number. On July 8th, after speaking with the MCSO deputies, David wrote a check for $39,000 to complete his truck purchase. Investigators also found and talked with the house cleaners who told them David said his dog bled on the carpet and he asked them to remove the stain. Though the bodies were not found at the time, prosecutors proceeded with indicting David for all three murders. He was convicted on April 1st, 2002. He was sentenced to death by a separate jury in March of 2004. In October of 2005, when construction workers in Buckeye found buried barrels with bones inside, the medical examiner determined they were the remains of Donna Anthony, along with her daughter and son. And that was another part of this urban legend that people used to tell. They said that he buried them in the backyard, but they also said that he buried them behind a Walmart that was really close by. And honestly, that was a part of the story. I had no idea that that was true. And it's crazy that we were all talking about this stuff like it was a joke like we were just trying to scare ourselves but this was something that happened it wasn't just a story that somebody made up they tied it to this house and it was unrelated to the house but I don't think any of us knew that at the time like it's just it's so sad. In 2008, the Arizona Supreme Court overturned Anthony's conviction and he was given a new trial. In September of 2012, he was convicted once again of all three murders just a few months before he died in prison. He died in prison on December 7th, 2012 at the age of 64. I found another article, which I'll have linked down below, which goes into more detail kind of about Donna and her children, and then it also goes more in depth with the trial and the other suspects. David Anthony is a convicted murderer who allegedly killed his wife and her two children. The Anthony murder case and subsequent trial received much media attention in the United States, particularly in Arizona. Anthony's wife, the former Donna Romero, had been married once before to Samuel Romero. She had two children from her first marriage, Danielle and Richard. On July 7, 2001, Donna, Anthony, and her children were declared as missing by the Arizona Police Department. Two weeks later, on July 21st, David Anthony was arrested in connection with the disappearances. Anthony's defense introduced Rosa Romero, who had been married to Samuel Romero. According to court records, Rosa declared that Samuel had a violent character and had threatened her before for, and she suspected it was him, not David Anthony, who may have been involved in the disappearance of Donna Anthony and her two children. This is another part of the story um, that gets really sad, so this is a trigger warning for sexual assault. And it's just, an, I, like, I can't believe that I didn't know these things back then, or I never thought to look into it until now. It says, Vince Imbordino, a deputy attorney working with Maricopa County, accused Anthony of killing his wife and her children in order to hide the sexual assaults he had been allegedly committing against Danielle. And Bordino also said that Anthony had stolen money from Donna Anthony, and he signaled David Anthony as a man who enjoyed flirting with numerous other women. On April 1st, 2012, despite the lack of physical evidence linking Anthony to the three disappearances, he was found guilty of three charges of first-degree murder. And I found that part absolutely insane. They didn't have the bodies. It's very hard to be convicted of a crime when you don't have proof that they're even dead. He did have the two bloody knives, but other than that, they really didn't have anything else to go off of. So that's just fucking unbelievable to me that they were able to convict him of three murders without three bodies. As time went by, the mystery of Donna Anthony's disappearance, as well as those of her children, grew, as did the Phoenix Police's frustration due to the lack of physical evidence connecting Anthony to it, except for a sample of Danielle Romero's blood and David Anthony's semen that were apparently found close to each other at a mattress in the Anthony's home. That part kind of confused me. It's just, it's fucked up, but it did say in the other news report that he bought all new mattresses, so I'm not sure 
what happened there. Oh my god, I don't even know how I missed this part. I think I just overlooked this because I read the entire first article, but holy fuck. It says on October 18th, 2005, construction workers who had been contracted to work on the building of a Walmart store found two trash drums hidden under a tree in Buckeye, 40 miles from downtown Phoenix. Skeletal remains were found inside the drums. I didn't realize that that was another true part of the story. I can't believe that that's another part of the story that we would tell as a joke, like as a ghost story that's true. And reading the other article, it kind of made it seem like they were just starting to build in an area that didn't have anything yet. It was just like a field, a dirt field. I didn't realize that that was true. God, it's fucked up. Police were called to investigate the area, and after collecting the skeletons, DNA testing was performed, confirming that the skeleton belonged to Donna Anthony and her daughter, who was 14 at the time of her death. On October 31st, police investigating the area found a third trash bin with more remains inside. The third trash can was found with the help of a metal detection machine that had been loaned by the Phoenix Police Department from the United States Air Force. Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio, a particularly outspoken sheriff, told the Arizona Republic that he was 99% sure that the remains inside the bin belonged to Donna Anthony's son, Richard, who was 12 at the time of his death. Arpaio has expressed his views on the Anthony murder case, saying on a press conference that he hopes to be around however long it will take to see the needle go into Anthony's arm, adding that he guarantees that he will be at the execution chamber to witness Anthony's death. Honestly, I would, I, if he wasn't already dead, I'd be right there fucking with you. And then at the time of this article, it said that he was still appealing his murder convictions, but he passed away in prison. I don't know. It's just, it's so weird thinking back when I, I know I already said this, but it's just so crazy to think back when I was in high school telling this ghost story and freaking ourselves out and going to this house and thinking like, oh, this is what happened here. And it's actually something that happened, just not there, not at that house. Like, that's just like, it keeps like... I don't know, it's hard for me to comprehend that, I guess. Because even though we wanted to believe it because we wanted to freak ourselves out, there was always something in the back of our mind saying, this isn't actually true. It's just an abandoned house that people have fucked up. But it is, it, but it is true. Watching that documentary, as shitty as it was, made me really want to tell you guys about what actually happened. And it may not be related to the house necessarily, but I thought it'd be important for me to tie the two together. Unfortunately, I can't take you guys to the house any longer because it is new and it's beautiful and it's done and it doesn't look nearly the same anymore. A part of me is kind Kind of sad that it's gone like we'll never be able to see it again another part of me is really happy because they fixed it up and nobody can fuck with that poor house anymore and the biggest part of me is honestly just shocked that the story was true if you guys want to watch the documentary you can i believe it's just called cali lejos it's on amazon prime it's nine minutes kind of a waste of nine minutes but if you want to watch something that like shows you what i just told you then you can do that in summary the short film is about an abusive dad and the family trying to get away and him killing them. That's all that happens in like the nine minutes. It starts with the mom telling the kids they need to pack and to not give anything away that they're leaving, like that he cannot know. And then the dad goes into the son's room and he's like, where's your sister? He's like, oh, she's probably packing. And so then that gives it away and everyone dies. That's pretty much how it ends. I honestly, I feel like they shouldn't have related it back to the house because I feel like it discredits the story almost, the tragedy that happened. And I feel like they also could have told the story a lot better than they did. I, I'm not trying to be a movie critic right now. I mean, it's not that big of a deal. It's a short film, but I just, I thought it was weird. I, I think it's weird that they made it how it, how they made it. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I know it's a little bit different. It was kind of like a true crime mixed with a story time. I don't really know how to describe it. Again, I'll have all my sources linked down below. And if I forget to do that, please just remind me because I know I'm really bad at remembering to do that kind of stuff, but please remind me and I will link both of the articles and I'll even put the name of the movie down below. I need to go put my cat down for a nap because he is exhausted. He was playing like that whole time. It took me a very long time to film this because I was trying to film in between him shaking this little ball. I actually had to take the ball away at one point because it was getting really bad but I gave him another toy to play with don't worry I didn't I didn't deprive my cat of his toys but he can have that back now but he's tired so I'm gonna go lay with him I love you guys I will see you in the next one bye do you guys like my ketchup pants I know I wear them all the time and they're really ugly but I can't stop wearing them but they look like they, they look like ketchup ketchup pants see ya